Hey everyone, just a quick intro. The talk that you're about to see was filmed just about a couple of hours ago at the Pilgrim Artists Festival for, um, for an audience of about maybe 16, 17 people. Um, the talk was The Secrets of the Neurodivergent Writer, How to Write When Your Brain Doesn't Want To. And yeah, that's basically all the introduction you need, I think, enjoy. Okay, so um, you guys are here today to um, hear me talking about secrets of the neurodivergent writer or how to write your book when your brain just doesn't want to let you. Um, it's something that I suffer with on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. It's just, it's a never ending struggle. It doesn't stop, it doesn't get better. Um, you do find ways around it, but it's not something you can cure it because it's literally the way your brain works. Um, and to get into a discussion of the things that work and how you can actually make your brain work for you um, under these circumstances and how to get stuff written when your brain really doesn't want to, you have to first approach why that's necessary and, and the benefits that actually come with the kind of brain that you've got or the kind of brain that one of your loved ones has. Um, so first of all, I want to discuss um, one of the biggest things that I've found about being ADHD and that is that the world isn't set up for you. It's, it's just not set up for the way that your brain works. It's set up for the way that a neurotypical person's brain works because that is the vast majority of people. Understandably enough, they cater to the, the standard and that's the sort of thing that you find in male dominated spaces where things are only set up for males and not for females. Um, I read a story some time, about, some time ago about how female astronauts have to work significantly harder to adapt within the spaces when they're in outer space because everything, the equipment, everything that will anchor them to the ground or that they can use on a space station or a, a do they still call them spaceships, rockets? I have no idea, but everything that's on there is set up for male sizes. And so the females have to work harder and they have to work within a framework that's set up for male, uh, male shapes. And that's something that you're probably going to find with your ADHD, neurodivergency. For instance, classrooms are not set up for neurodivergent people. Um, I, one of my earliest memories at school is my teacher, now this was a very small school, so all the grades were all in together. There was maybe 18 people on the biggest year. Um, so the, those of us in grades one to three were sitting in the front row. Um, the teacher couldn't keep up with me. I was bored, I was annoyed. I was just sitting in a line. So what the teacher did was give me grade three or four work on a worksheet and that kept me so happy just doing work that was making my brain work that that actually worked. Um, and later on, of course, come in and take a seat. I'm sorry, I'm late. No, no, you're fine. And then later on, of course, that's stretched to homework as well because homework is also not set up for neurodivergent people, specifically ADHD. Um, I remember, again, one of my earliest memories was being absolutely freaked out that at the end of my holidays, which I was meant to do a task every single day and write it in my, uh, write it in my little book, um, can any of you guess when I did that homework that was meant to be done every single day and, and given to the teacher on the first day of school? The day before the came to school. No, I did it on the morning, morning of. Off. I did it on the morning <laughs> of. Um, that was, that was not something I was able to do. In, in fact, even uh, this talk, for example, I have a really nice little pamphlet here with scattered thoughts. Um, any guesses as to when when I wrote all of this out? <laughs> Funnily enough, I'm getting better. It was yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's not set up for us. that The way our brains work, the way we want to do stuff, is that if you have a long portion of time, we're going to do anything but because our brain will not want to focus and then we will panic and do everything at the last moment. And that's... That's how I've lived my entire life. Um, obviously, we're doing a talk now about how to make your brain work for you, which is why I'm going to be explaining some things that actually worked for me and hopefully some that'll work for you guys as well. Um, but it all comes back to understanding that the world is not set up for you. You're going to have to figure out ways around the way the world is set up 
and to make your own little world around you. Um, even methods of learning outside of school are not set up for ADHD people. Um, the way I do most of my study is either by accident because I go on YouTube and I just follow rabbit trail after rabbit trail. Um, I did a whole in-depth um, study of sugar babies once because I just found one and she had an interesting story. And I was like, I want to know more about why this kind of person goes into that kind of a life and why this is the way it is. I, I ended up doing hours of research on, I, I don't want to be a sugar baby. <laughs> I have no interest in being a sugar baby, but I wanted to know why that mindset, why does she think the way she thinks? Why do the men in that lifestyle think the way they think? How do they react and act with each other? How do they change each other and become um, more what they are? Why is this a lifestyle? Um, so you're probably also going to find that perhaps you, the same as me, find trouble reading physical books and go with audio books. Find a seat down here, we've got one more for you. Um, you might find that you can't concentrate on audiobooks and you need physical books. It's, it's going to be a way of finding out how to do that because the regular ways are probably not going to work the best for you unless you're really, really interesting, uh, interested in that. Yes, if you're interesting, that will make a big difference. <laughs> no, unless you're actually interested in, in what you're studying, um, which is not always something that is actually going to mean that you can focus even though it should. Um, the last point I want to make with the world not being set up for you is that our bodies often feel like they aren't set up for us. Um, the emotions feel too big. The brain feels too slow or too quick or it won't stop or it just isn't able to focus. It, we ADHD people in particular, and you'll remember I spoke about um, before in the lead up the difference between ADHD, autism, all a neurodivergency. Um, the only way, and the way I'm speaking is with a focus toward ADHD because although I grew up in a family that had multiple people with autism and we were heavily involved in the autism scene in terms of um, volunteering when I was younger, my only view of that is from the outside. So I focus mostly on ADHD because that's what I know However, a lot of this will have crossover, so pro there's probably a good half of this that will also work for you if you are, especially if you are late diagnosed with autism as well. I can't say all of it will, but I know there's significant crossover, so hopefully it'll still be helpful. And that goes straight back to our bodies feeling like they aren't set up for us, because when you think about a task and getting a task done, my father often says to me, well, don't you, don't you just feel really accomplished when you finish something? And I said to him, no, I, I've never felt satisfied and accomplished. I don't get satisfaction from finishing a job, from, from doing a job well. I just don't get that. I don't get dopamine from that. I don't get satisfaction. That is not the way my body's set up. So even, even your own body can feel like it isn't set up for you. And we'll go into that a little bit more later, but I just want to make sure that, you know, a lot of you here are Christians. I know some of you probably aren't. My listeners online, there will be a lot that aren't, but I'm saying this to the Christians among us, that God has made you like this for a purpose. There's the, the way you are, the way you are, even though it feels like you're not at home in your body, even though it feels like your brain is not working with you, you are made like this for a purpose and you can find a purpose in your writing and in the way you write and you can do a lot of good with your writing because the world needs ADHD writers, it needs neurodivergent writers. Um, so going on from that I want to talk about the benefits of your mind and what you can offer that's unique in the world as somebody who has an ADHD or an autistic mind, um, what the upsides potentially are. And one of the big ones is that you think in a way that neurotypical people either can't or don't. Most of the time it's can't. Um, and you make connections with other people, with the world, with your writing. You make connections that other people just can't do. And since there are other people out there who are underserved by the neurotypical writers, you're going to find an audience who needs to hear what you're saying, who needs to hear your point of view and who needs to feel like, oh wow, there's, there's people like me out there. Um, so one of the benefits is that you, the way your mind is unique, you, you have something unique to share. It's, it's really important to understand that it's not just a mistake, it's not just 
a miswired brain, it is actually, it is actually a unique and beautiful outlook. It gives you trouble, yes. It it's difficult to live with sometimes, but you have something that other people don't have. This also means that you're going to be able to work in a way that neurotypical people can't. Um, the problems with focus, that leads you to being able to hyper multitask. You'll be able to do a hundred different things at once and keep them in the air, in your head. Um, I constantly have neurotypical friends saying to me, how do you write the way you write? I could not keep that straight in my head. I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, I don't write in chronological order usually. I also often don't write in order within a scene. It's messy, but it works for me. And also the way the story comes out naturally from what I've written is that it grows on its own while I'm writing and then all of a sudden everything links together, um, which is really helpful when you're doing stuff like time travel and things like that. <laughs> So you're going to be able to hyper-focus, you're going to be able to also hyper-multitask on things. And when you have your hyper-focus, there's nothing that's going to stop you. In fact, to an unhealthy degree, which we'll also <laughs> talk about later. But for now, hyper-focus, I want to say that hyper-focus is not a net evil. It is actually a good thing. It's a useful thing. You just need to learn how to channel it and to not be injured by it. Um, and going on from what we said before in that you think in a way that neurotypical people don't, um, you offer a perspective that only you can give. Things are probably, one of the things I've learned about ADHD is that feelings are often stronger, they're often overwhelming. Um, so you're going to probably feel things more deeply. Things are going to touch you more deeply and affect you more harshly. And if you're anything like me, you're going to feel like you're in the world, but you're not quite in the world fully. You can feel really disconnected from it sometimes, just going back to that thing where the world isn't set up for you. So that perspective is something that is good and useful to share. It's something that there are other people out there who are going to be touched by that and, and be able to understand from that. It also means that neurotypical people are going to be able to get in your mind a little bit and to understand a way of thinking that they've possibly never considered before. Because after all, reading and writing are ways that we experience the world, that we share our view of the world, and it's how we learn about the way that other people view the world as well as sharing our view of the world. So books do change people. They, they give you new insights into people's characters and into their minds, and it ends up changing you, which is exactly what you want to have happen to you, but also what you want to give to the world if you very possibly can. Um, and last of all, in talking about the benefits before we go on to actually how to make this work for you, is that you're going to produce your perspective in a way that only you can produce it. And this goes back to um, working in a way that neurotypical people can't work or don't work, um, because the way that you produce your book, the way that you write it, the way that you experience the writing of it, that's actually going to affect the end product. It's going to affect the way your book reads, it's going to affect the things that are in it, and you'll be able you'll probably be able to um have a more organic growth of of story within that once you learn how to use certain structures to help yourself along so you are you're going to be able to produce something that not many other people are able to produce because obviously adhd is not the easiest thing to work with autism is also very much not the easiest thing to work with and the people who actually successfully finish a book, let alone publish a book, let alone become sell, sell, sell well enough to be able to do it as a living, are even less. So there are less of these stories out here, um, which means that this perspective that you've got, this thing that only you can produce, is going to be a valuable thing out in the world. So going on to finding what works, um, what, what I want to look at in this section is not just finding what works, but playing to your strengths. Because we said before that yes, there are bad things about being neuro, neurodivergent. Um, so you need to find out what works for you, not what works for the world at large, not the, the writing advice that everyone out there is giving because nine times out of 10, it's probably not going to work for you. That other one time it will work for you and that will be great, but you don't need to be beating yourself up because the advice that you were given by other writers like you must write every day you must write this amount of words every day 
you must write in the three act structure, you must write in the five act structure, you must make sure that your plot is this and that. Um, most of the time that's just not going to work for, you, for anyone who is neurodivergent. Um, some of the things will, but most of them won't. So what you need to do, and this is more difficult because it is also, there is some variation between neurodivergent people, is that you need to find your strengths. So for me, what I call this is hacking my brain, which is basically finding ways of working that work for you. There are some things I can give you that work for me now, and I think you'll find if you work on them, a lot of them will work for you as well, but they're not all going to work for you. So find the things that do work for you, and once you've found those things, you keep doing them. So for me, hacking my brain, part of that is preparing my workspace. Um, I can work anywhere, quite honestly, but my productivity, my output, and how engaged I am in my writing is highly dependent on having one to three of the things I'm going to mention happening at one time. So for me, that means going to a cafe. So a cafe has color and movement. It has lots of people around, but it's a babble. So I don't have to focus on any specific thing. There's just babble. If I don't have music, then that's good enough. People, and no, some people do talk to you, um, which is really annoying, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but most of the time people aren't going to talk to you. If you've got your laptop out and you're working, unless it's a friend, they're usually not going to talk to you. Um, so having, for me, having that cafe where there's a babble, but nothing that I can concentrate on one specific voice, that's great. It gives me enough bubble, but enough babble as well. So I've, I'm separated from it, but I've still got the, the cotton wool of it around me. It means sitting in a comfy upright chair. You'll probably notice I'm sitting fairly upright at the moment. Um, I have back issues, but also I find that for writing as well, it doesn't really matter what I do with my legs. Half the time I'll have them crossed underneath me. Half the time they'll be as they are now. So long as I can have my back straight, shoulders up, um, I find that that's, that's the best position for me. Um, so having a comfy chair, having something that can help me sit upright, it somehow tells, because I've done it so often, it tells my brain, right, this is work mode. We're ready to go, ready to go. Focus, yes. And it does that. So once you've, once you've got something that works for you, a couple of things that work for you, start preparing those things for yourself every day if you can. You don't have to because it's not going to happen every day, but preparing it every day is also a good habit to get into. So um, before you go to bed, making sure that if you work at your desk, that your desk is tidy so that it doesn't hurt your brain to look at it and make you think, I've got to clean up before I can do anything. And then you'll end up cleaning your entire room. You won't, you won't work. Um, if you're like me, you'll keep doing other stuff and you'll go out of your room to put something away that shouldn't be in your room and then you'll make yourself a cup of tea and then you'll forget about the work. So setting stuff up the night before really works well for me. Setting out my clothes the night before also really, really works for me um, because one of the barriers to me getting up and getting about is that I just, no, number one, I don't want to get out of bed. <laughs> number two, I, I, I'm just like, well, I'm in my pajamas and I'm comfortable. Um, so having clothes there ready to go, preparing the night before, that helps. Um, this speaks to a common ADHD thing, and I'm not sure if it's true of autism as well, but that is object impermanence, where if you put something away, that thing just disappears from your mind forever. I find this in the fridge as well. I put food in there. Mum puts stuff in front of it. I forget it's there. It goes off in the fridge. Um, anything that I put away that I don't see anymore, it doesn't exist. It just doesn't. So. That is one of the things that you need to help yourself get past whatever way works for you is, is that object impermanence. So setting up your room, your clothes, your computer the night before is going to work for you. And one of the things about preparing my space that also works for me, the biggest thing in fact that has worked for me is noise cancelling earphones and a writing playlist. So I've talked about this before in other talks I've done on more generalized things of how to get a book written, your first book written. But specifically for neurodivergent people, those noise cancelling earphones give you a bubble, you're disconnected from the world again, you're in your own focus space, you're not doing anything else. And that writing playlist, you remember how I said hack your brain? This is part of brain hacking. There is an actual name for it, I've forgotten what it is. Um, 
but you have one specific playlist and you only play that playlist when you're writing. You don't play it any other time, but you play it every time you're writing. This may be just a song on repeat for you. This might be white noise for you. This might be a specific playlist for me. Music might not work for you. It might be only choral music or only voiceless music. Whatever it is, you'll probably find that some version of this is going to work for you. So long as you can keep that separate from anything else that you do and only listen to it while you're writing and always, if you possibly can, listen to it while you're writing. I've had times when I have thought, I'm just not going to work today. And I have put my earphones on and just listened to music for listening to music. And I just started writing. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even a conscious choice. It was just there. And because on my computer, I have all of the um, books I'm currently working on in my bar just to click on and they'll pop straight up. Um, because of that preparedness, because it's just always there, then I was able to do that. So all the roadblocks being removed, my brain switched on and we were just off. So that's one of the biggest things is preparing your space. The second thing I want to talk about is you don't have to do things in order. Um, embrace the chaos, basically. People keep, when, when I was starting writing, the thing is, you, you know, you start at the start of the book or you start at the start of the story and you write down and then you finish the story. That does not work for me. It has never worked for me. I, I don't think I've written a single book start to finish. Um, what usually works for me is I'll write the start, I'll probably write the first two chapters, something like that, or I'll write the first five chapters, but they won't be all complete. There'll be bits and pieces in each. And then I'll usually write the end chapter or at least the end bits. And then I'll probably write part of the big climax and then I will just fill in bits, whatever I feel like writing the, the day. Now it does help, yes, for story continuity, it does help if you can write from start to finish. That's great if you can do that, you possibly can, I can't. Um, but if you're writing and you've come to a bit where you're just stuck and you're thinking, but I really wanna go on and write that really cool part, go on and write the cool part. The rest is still going to be there. It's not going to change. You're not going to miss out on anything. You might have to tweak some things in edits. I always have to tweak things in edits, but that's okay because nine times out of 10, your book is not going to go in the way you think it is. If you're like me, if you don't actually do much planning, like if you don't sit down and write out an outline, which I honestly rarely do, um, I'm working with an outline at the moment, but that's very unusual for me. And my outline is just basically sentences and a mishmash of notes that's my outline that that's what it is and chapter headings like the names of them but if if you're finding that you're having trouble with that yeah just write as far as you can and then just think oh i will write that cool scene or oh i've just had a great idea for a character interaction i will do that because your story is never going to go in the way that you think it will it just it just isn't um even if you've got an outline i i'm <laughs> I'd be willing to bet you it's still not going to go in the way you think it's going to go. So feel free to just embrace that chaos. Don't do things in order, do things the way you like. Just write those bits you want to write. You will be able to connect them. And when you've got your moments of hyper-focus, or usually for me it's at the end and it's like eight hours in one day of hyper-focus, you write all the boring bits then. Nobody's going to care, they won't notice the difference. I've not noticed much difference between the quality apart from typos because I'm dyslexic as well, hey. Um, you probably won't notice anything except more mistakes. The actual quality of the writing probably is not gonna be that much different. You just might miss a few connections. And then you'll have to go back and read for clarity, fix those connections so that people who don't have the same kind of brain as you can understand what you were going for in what you've written. So apart from uh, not having to do things in order, um, you also need to understand that bribery is good. Bribery is wonderful. Um, if you're like me, you're not going to get dopamine and satisfaction from finishing your book. For me, I finished my 10 book series. Um, it was the biggest series I've done to date. I've done things in there I'm really happy with. I'm so glad I did that. But I did not feel the slightest bit of satisfaction. I didn't feel like, wow, I've just accomplished a really big thing. Do you know what my biggest feeling was? Any guesses as to the biggest feeling? Disappointment that it was undone. That's really close. That's actually really, really close. Um, it was just like this huge hollow emptiness inside me because the thing, the thing was done and gone 
and there was nothing to replace it, but there was also no satisfaction that I had finished it. Um, so there are multiple ways you can do, you can find your way around that. But one of the best ways I've found is basically self-bribery. Um, you might notice my shoes, excuse me, putting my feet on the table. These were a bribe. Um, these were a bribe for getting my latest book done because I could not concentrate on getting it done. So I bought them and I sat them in my room and I was not allowed to wear them until I finished that book. And when I finished that book, I wore them and I was, and I got satisfaction from that. I didn't get satisfaction from finishing the book. I was just tired and sick and empty. But I put my shoes on that I had bribed myself with and I was like, wow, these are nice shoes. <laughs> and I went out in my nice shoes and I felt like, ooh, these, these, this makes me feel good. I like this. I know life is not all about feeling good, but when you're chronically lacking in dopamine and satisfaction for completing really very impressive work, it's a way that you can experience that satisfaction. It does come with its downsides because you might end up just being a shopaholic, um, but object impermanence is your friend in this case. If you're worried about going overboard with the shopping and self-satisfaction that way, um, start doing the, um, the digital version of eye shopping where you add things to cart and just leave that tab there or click straight out of it afterward. I promise you, you'll still get the same feeling, but you won't have spent all your money. And then just save this for, you know, for, for things like this, like even this ring on this hand, this was for the completion of a fairly big thing as well. So I do that, but on a smaller level, bribery is also great. Um, so when I finish a thousand words for the day, I give myself a little sticker. I buy so many stickers. I buy special stickers because I love stickers and I stick them on my little planner because I have finally managed to make a planner work for me like 90% of the time. Yes, it's not easy. <laughs> it is really not easy because it's more fun writing out the planner than it is actually using the planner. <laughs> but if you, if you use the stickers as well and mark off your do this amount, do that amount on your planner, that helps a lot. Otherwise, a calendar is also great and you stick the little stickers on the calendar. So small level bribery is good. Big level bribery is also great. Also, you end up with really nice shoes. <laughs> so I highly, I highly uh, recommend doing that. Um, as I said before, music is also your friend, but you need to find what works for you and the way that works for you. Because nine times out of 10 music of some sort is definitely going to work for you. But some people can't have voices in their music. Some people only can have voices. Some people only want one song played on repeat over and over and over again. Some people want white noise. Me, I have a couple of playlists that I listen to depending on the feel of the story. And for me, that works great. I don't work anywhere near as well if I'm lacking either music or the babble of a cafe around me. Um, and you're also going to find, you remember how I said to set up your space and cafes work for me? Sensory input is going to make a really big difference to you and it's going to be a, a minus and also a plus because if your socks are uncomfortable, then this is why I wear my socks inside out because the little seams bug me. Um, if you wear your socks right way in, maybe that seems going to annoy you. Maybe your jeans are going to annoy you. Jeans are really uncomfortable for sitting and working. They're great for going out, for sitting at a computer and working, not so great. Um, so sensory stuff, sensory input makes a big difference. Scent, temperature, noise level. If you can find a way to make that work for you and find out what works for you, again, for me, that's a cafe. A hundred, not 100% because sometimes people come in with perfume and it never, they, they always want to share it. So they bathe in it and then it fills the entire room and then I get very, very cranky. Um, so, so that's going to make a difference to you. Find out what works for you. T take notes if you have to, because if you're like me, you're probably going to forget the things that work. So when you can, use your, use your phone, use the little notes app. I have like a Uber note. It has a million things in it and I just scroll down for all the bits that I want. I have like grocery shopping list, things I have to do, bits of a story. Uh, until a little while ago, I had this in there as well. Just use your notes app, make notes, find out what works for you and then you can start implementing it on the regular. Um, and the last thing I wanna talk about in finding strengths is um, that small breaks make a really big difference. So there is a thing called, a, I think it's Pomodoro timer um, you can find it on iPhone, you can find it on, um, on what's the other one called? Um, 
Android. Android, that's the word, thank you. You can find it on pretty much any app store. There will be a version of a Pomodoro timer. You don't need it. You can use your inbuilt one on your phone. And what you will do is, because you will find that, again, with this, there are different people work different ways. I usually set it for an hour and then a 10 minute break. So an hour work, a 10 minute break. Most Pomodoro timers want you to work for 20 minutes and have a five minute break. That doesn't work very well for me. It does if I'm having super huge problems with focus. Mm -hmm. So the, the more frazzled your brain is, probably the shorter time spans you want to work and the shorter breaks will work for you. But for me at the moment when I'm working in peak condition, it's an hour work and about 10 minutes break. And I do that with my phone. So it will do the, um, it would just do the little alarm when I've got to an hour or I just look and find that it's an hour and that works for me as well. Um, but those small breaks, just 10 minutes, just five minutes, you'll find something that works for you. They let your brain do the cartwheels and do the internet stuff that you want to do. Like I, I usually use that to check Twitter check, or X, whatever. <laughs> Um, and Instagram, Instagram's one of my favorite places to be. Um, I go to Facebook sometimes, I'll post snippets of what I'm working on for, for my readers. So just those small breaks, they're going to make a really big difference to your brain. Your brain's going to just be like, <gasps> I can breathe. And then you'll be ready to dive back into work. Um, just finding what works for you is probably the best way. If you're not used to focusing um, at start, I, I, I would say probably go with the you know, classic Pomodoro timer that will give you 20 minutes on, five minutes <laughs> off. Um, and just try and do a couple of sessions all at once. Um, so that's all the stuff that will hopefully hack your brain find, and find ways to work. Tailor it to your own needs because you'll find that some things won't work. But usually if I have one to three of these things that I've mentioned happening, I can get a good day's work done. If I have multiple ones of these, then I get a really good day's work done. Um, so that's how it works for me. Hopefully it will also work for you guys. So then I want to go on and talk about unhealthy work traps um, and finding healthy rules for a healthy creative life. Because let's be honest, the way our brains work or the way my brain works is that I will leave everything to the last minute and then I have 30,000 words to write in the last week, which means I have to do multiple days of eight hours and, and I have to sit down for eight to nine hours per day just solidly focusing only on this. And because I'm panicked and because I've made hard deadlines for myself, which apparently I need um, for some sort of structure, <laughs> then I literally have to get the work done. So my brain is capable of doing it and it does it, but it is by no means a healthy way to live your life. Um, usually how that works and how it works in the past um, is that I will get to that point and I will do that week and I'll do those eight to nine hour days purely focusing on writing. And I'm not saying eight hours sitting down doing something working. No, this is eight hours of complete focus only writing. Um, I, I literally nearly go mad. My mother comes to my room and sort of throws food at me because I forget to eat, I forget to go to the toilet. I forget to do anything. I just sit and I write and it's not sustainable. So at the end of that, I get sick every single time, of course, because if you do that to your body, you're going to get sick. You're going, your mind is going to be exhausted. Your body is going to be exhausted. And then you won't be able to fight off whatever little germ it is that your nephews are bringing into the house. Um, so it, it, it does work. I'm not going to lie. It definitely works. That panic mad rush at the end, it will definitely work, but it's also not healthy. There's also the issue of constant guilt and that mental churn um, as, as your brain is like, we've got to work, we've got to work, we've got to, why didn't you work then? I know you were sick, but that's not a good enough excuse. I know you were throwing up, that's not a good enough excuse. You need to work, work, work. We need to get the job done. And that constant guilt and that mental churn, it also takes its toll on you. Also, there's no reason for you to live like that, that it's just not a pleasant way to live apart from what it will do to you at the end. And of course, that ends up, that constant churn ends up giving you issues with your self-worth as that just plummets because you're failing each and every day to do as much as you need to do or that you think you should do in the lead up to this panic rush at the end. You're like, why didn't I work today? I didn't work today. I need to do that. I'm just garbage. I'm a rubbish writer. I'm a rubbish person there is something fundamentally wrong with my brain. 
and it gets you into that line of thought about yourself that just isn't true and I, I'm going to say here it isn't necessarily true because yes, sometimes we do just do other stuff. But the thing is the way your brain is set up, that focus is what's lacking. So of course you're going to have trouble focusing. It's not something you're doing on purpose or because you're lazy. Your brain literally is not set up to focus in a way that it needs to focus to get the job done. So that that constant guilt and the issues with self-worth, the the bodily issues just of being sick from that are several of the things that I've come across personally in my own life as I try and write my books and try to live a sustainable author life that I realize need to be fixed which is why I do all of the stuff that we mentioned earlier to try and make sure that I'm writing consistently rather than just in one rush at the end. So leading on from this with your unhealthy work traps and the things that have worked for you to be able to play to your strengths. Um, one really, really important thing that you need to know um, is that sometimes, no matter how well you know yourself, no matter how well you understand how to hack your own brain to do this, to do that, sometimes everything is literally not going to work. There is going to be a point in your life, there's going to be more than one point in your life. There is just gonna be some times where no matter what you do, no matter how well you understand yourself, everything that you have tried before is going to fail and you are not going to be able to work. That's just a thing that's going to happen. And so I wanna be able to discuss what we're going to do when everything that has worked in the past is no longer working for you. And I'm saying all of this from bitter experience like Patience the Milkmaid, a bitter experience has taught me. And, and it is several bitter experiences. Um, there, there are going to be those times when none of your methods work, everything you've learned by trial and error, and, and it's going to be stuff you've learned over the years, and it's so frustrating, but it's not going to work. So when that happens, you're going to have to make a choice. You're going to have to choose whether to go back to the panic that always works or to try and work your way through and find another solution. And I do want to say here that it is 100% legitimate to go back to panic work. It really is, sometimes you just need to get the job done. Sometimes that one time out of 10 or 20 or 30, that one time is going to be necessary to work at all costs and it's unhealthy but it is effective. So there's going to be times when Yes, that's the only thing you can do. You should try and make those as few as possible because they are really unhealthy and also because there is actually a better way. Um, it needs to be a one-off situation instead of your normal, which is what I was running at. That was my normal, just panic every time. <coughs> so it's far better to either try and find new ways that work for you, like look around to see what's worked for other people and try those things, or to go on to what we're going to talk about next which is almost always like 99.99999% of the time the problem and also going to work. And it's going to seem really counterintuitive. It, it's not going to seem like it's something that should work or that should be right. But the thing is, you, you can't understate the importance of rest. When you have a deadline that needs to be met, and you're like, but I need to work, I need to get everything done, and I'm panicked because I haven't gotten enough done. Nine times out of 10, even like, even more than that, nine and a half, 9.7 times out of 10, you need to rest. You need to protect yourself and say, at the end of this time, six o'clock every day, I'm gonna stop. Doesn't matter if I've gotten my work done for the day, doesn't matter if I've finished it, we stop then, on the weekend. Saturday or Sunday or both of those days are my days off, the work stops then. We are not going to work after that point. It stops whether I've got that work done or not, it stops. And what that does is, again, it hacks your brain, it rewires your brain, or at least it does with me. So when I got to the end of six o'clock and I was like, but I have not done my work, and the rule was you cannot work, you can feel guilty, and at first you probably will feel guilty, but after a while that stops because that's a rule now. That, that's a rule. 
there's no working after six o'clock, you can't feel guilty for not working because that's the rules, you're following the rules. The rules say no work after six o'clock, you stop work at six o'clock, that's all you can do, you've done. The same thing with on the weekends. There's no, no room for guilty feelings because you are abiding by the rules for what works in your life to be a writer, to get that work done. And it also tricks your brain into doing every day what it would normally do in the last few hours or the last few days or the last few weeks of a project is, I've only got this time, I've got to work, I've got to, I've got to do the work, but it does it in a much more contained and healthy way. So you've rewired your brain in this way to be like, rest is good, I need that rest. You're also getting rest. You're also getting away from the guilt and the churn and you're also providing an artificial condition where your brain is like, oh, oh gotta get the work done, gotta get the work done, only got this time. Um, I found as, as an example that I was getting a lot more work done in the days when I literally only had my lunch hour to work in, when I was working at a company as well as uh, doing my books. I got a lot more work done in my lunch hour than I did in the couple years when I first went full-time writing. Mm -hmm. I was just doing better that way because there was that artificial condition of, we need to get the work done in this time. So you're going to have that structured, enforced rest. There is a certain point at which ADHD, neurotypical, uh, neurodivergent people need structure. We hate it, we dislike it greatly, but we need at least a certain amount. Usually that's a skeleton kind of structure, but that enforced rest usually 99.999 times going to work for you because it helps to get rid of that exhaustion of the mind that never stops. And some of the ways you can get that rest efficiently is by finding yourself a hobby. Now for me, that's photography. Um, it's a great hobby because it makes me use my body, it gets me out of a chair, it gets me outdoors when I'm not sick. Um, it also makes me look at the world in a different way, so it gives me a physical thing. Especially if you can find something that is physical, that involves moving, touching, anything that involves your other senses other than your brain and your eyes. Um, it's a great thing to choose. It helps your mind get that rest that it desperately needs. So you're also going to find when it comes to rest that when you're ramping up toward the end of a project with that inability to come down from that uh it's it's hard to explain what it is exactly um it's like being high on work and your brain won't stop and it just keeps moving i usually can't sleep several hours after finishing a book like actually finishing it right at the end um i often stay up till early in the morning because that just it doesn't work so if you want to be able to stop that happening if you want to be able to rest your brain and straight away get back into a healthy way of living you need to um, use what you've already established as your dopamine minds to sort of explode and bring you back down and those things are things that I talked about earlier your bribes to yourself your hobbies anything anything that you use to get dopamine instead of the satisfaction of finishing something will also probably help to bring you down from the high of, of writing so that you can actually bring yourself into a more physical space. So use the shoes you bribed yourself with, go out on an outing, use the handbag you bought yourself. I, I have done both of these things. I have, a spe I have several special handbags, several special pairs of shoes. Um, when I need to do something physical that will take me away from the mental just chaos, I pick a pair of shoes, I pick some nice clothes, some jewelry and a nice bag and I put a book in the bag or I put my camera, I have several cameras, I have some very old ones, I have some new ones, I put one of the cameras in the bag and I just go out, whether that's to the city streets or to a cafe, by the river, Do some, try to do something physical or you can also do the mindless TV route which is what I often do, just do a YouTube mindless TV. I'll, I will watch anything from home renovation shows, which I always love, to deep dives, again, the sugar baby debacle, um, rabbit trails on YouTube, just following one thing to the next thing to the next. It doesn't have to be big, it doesn't have to be important, but that regular churn of stuff will start to calm your mind down from all the bubble and the chaos that's happening toward the end, and it will help your brain to rest. So the benefits of resting, that structure for your work, 
when it means you work better. Um, once you've started to do that, it will become a habit. And there are times when you're going to break out of that habit when you've decided that this is one time when I have to just do the thing and work hard and just bother the hours we're going to do it. Um, but it's once you start doing that enough times, it's going to become your new structure, your new habit. And so those times when things are just really hard to do, um, they will become less and less and you will more quickly switch on to this is what works for me. This is how I get this thing to work for me. And after that happens, that means that it means that you're rewired, you're ready to go, and your body starts to heal from those unhealthy ways of working. So basically what it, what it boils down to is finding what works for you, hacking your brain to produce the best from your particular style of work, make, taking advantage of those hyper-focused moments, and really learning how to tap into resting and to living healthily with the way that your mind works. That's about all I have for the talk, but I would love to hear your thoughts or your questions. If you have any, um, just speak up loudly. If you do so, the microphone can catch it and then we can, um, then we can get that onto the internet as well. I've made sure I haven't captured your faces. Um, we'll, just go with, um, we'll just go with voices for now. But yeah, any questions? Thank you, I really enjoyed the talk. I thought you did a good job. Oh, thank you. Um, lots of things kept coming up for me as you were talking. Yes. Um, one, you were talking about the eight hours being too much to sustain, and it just reminded me of Cal Newport, who's very into the deep work, and he says it's really not reasonable to do more than about four yes. hours of deep work, and he says mm. even only try to start with maybe one and yes. get used to try and work deeply for that's just a that really good time. point no that's a really good point because four hours usually is my maximum for what i want to do on a regular weekly basis with that's my comfortable spot but also it's a i love the point that you've made that starting out with just one hour is a good way to start you don't want to just i mean no you probably do want to just go crazy you t that's it's all or nothing but Try to hold yourself back. Yeah, like you said, starting out with one hour is really, really good. The deep work is exhausting, it's hard. So yeah, I love that. And I think, well, coming from a beginner point of view, <laughs> that I just thought you'd do this for eight hours a day, just like you do everything else. So <laughs> a lot of people great, think that, that. yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure about neurotypical people. I know that's not sustainable for me personally. I don't think it's sustainable for anyone but I could be wrong because I only have my own brain to go with so <laughs> I think he's saying it's generalizable that um, works. I really liked the bit you were talking about doing a hobby or doing mm. a physical thing um, and I think you were saying using it for after you've been working and yeah. I really like that I think for me my brain is going fast and to just stop Yes. My brain just says, no! <laughs> yeah, it just wants to more. keep going, right? <laughs> and so I'm learning different activities I can do mm. to actually, I think of it like driving a car, when you change the gear down and you're slowing down, but you're still getting that feeling of pressure of mm. the, the engine is still turning. So for me, I like crochet. Crochet is wonderful. <laughs> if, if you can do it, I'm very yes. bad at crochet. I'm it's better just, at knitting. It's, it's personal, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. No, that's a really good point as well. The everyday come down from the high of writing is also just as important as the end of the project come down. And if you've got those rest structures established, that's usually I watch a bit of YouTube or I sit with my parents with a cup of tea. Like I go out, make myself a cup of tea sit with my parents and we watch Escape to the Country or whatever home show there is on that day. I'm, I'm going to be green, but this is my last time. No, 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 you're fine. We want the input. <laughs> so my, my other comment was just um, another neurodiversity that maybe people don't think of is trauma. Yes. So just if you've had trauma, your brain might be working differently. Yes, I can speak to that one as well. <laughs> Um, a lot of my readers, that they already know, but I was in an abusive marriage for 11 years. And I did, I didn't realize it, but I was doing all of my processing through writing. 
Um, so I come back and I read those books and I just see trauma scattered all through it. And it does, it does affect your process because if you've been using writing as a way to escape from what's happening in your daily life, it's hard to bring that to a healthy place where it's something that's good and fun and delightful to do um, when it's been a survival skill for you for a lot of time. I was, I was very lucky, very fortunate in that because I had been using it as, as processing. So for me, it wasn't a thing of, oh, this was my trauma safety place and now it's my job. It was just like, oh, I'm processing new things as I'm becoming healthy, I'm processing other things. I think that's a really great point. Thank you for bringing it up. Thanks I didn't actually um, I didn't actually think to add that there's a lot of things that are sort of in little sections in my life that don't really join together unless somebody mentions them and yeah that's a really good point to make now is there anyone else who's got either questions or comments or things that you just want to share that have either worked for you or that haven't worked for you anything that you would like to add we've got about five to ten more minutes to go I think so we've got the time if you want to talk with the bribery thing that you were mentioning, yes. I, do that, I do that, I didn't even realise it was like a thing that other right. people do. So like I do most of my writing at night time, like when mm -hmm. I go to bed and I'm sitting in bed with my laptop. Um, and I stay up too late to do that, but yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Don't I, we all? I struggle focusing unless I have, you know, like a little bribe. So I just get like a couple of chocolates or something and mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I'm going to write 20 minutes, have time on it, then I'm going to eat a chocolate, yep. have a little break, listen to my favourite song, and then I'm going to do it again. And that he kept, kept me actually mm -hmm. do it else. Like, do not write. <laughs> it works. I'll sort of sit there and eat chocolate. There's, yeah. there's another thing that you might find will add to that. I don't know. It works for me. I love it. Um, so I pair a tea with a cheese and a cracker, one that works really well with the specific cheese. But I also do a mix of, okay, again, I don't know if this is very specific to me or if it will work for others, but stuff with different textures if i have stuff with different textures it keeps my brain really happy while i'm writing so mm -hmm. think grapes that are cool and sweet and juicy and then you've got like some chips that are very crunchy and then you've got some cheese that is sharp and soft and then always there's always tea, um, <laughs> tea. <laughs> I, I don't know if that will that will help to add to your thing at all but that's that's a really good way of doing it yeah. And I think I also like kind of, I don't know if I did it on purpose ever, but I have it like the best chocolates at the end. Yes, you know, right? Yeah, like the best, like I get it up to like the best kind of one. You have to save the best chocolates till the yeah. end. That's just how it goes. You have to treat yourself right at the end so you feel extra happy when you end. Yeah. I'm going to have a huge problem though if I try to do that like, you know, fake shopping thing. It's like Papa's going to open his phone are you and be like, why are there three million Lego sets in my account? <laughs> are, you, are you going to end up with 30 more corsets? <laughs> I remember that. No, but the thing, the thing that works with that is if you just click out of it, like if you just X out of yeah. that tab, I think most of the time it clears your cart and then you'll be safe from dad's yeah. eyes. Lego and like, you know, Marvel merch and yep. then it's just... <laughs> you can also do the same thing with Pinterest and really nice clothes or aesthetics. Some people build Pinterest boards. I don't personally. Um, I'm not good at doing that sort of thing and I find it frustrating going through stuff like that. But it works for some people. They Pinterest, do, yeah. yeah, they do like mood boards for the current project and aesthetic boards and quote boards. I find that stops me from writing, but for other people that definitely works. I've never done that. I, I just say fan I do art. Every, every short you story do, I do. But you do fan art as well. For every yeah. short story. Yeah, I write a lot of short stories and usually they're that's like a, good way to a start. couple thousand words. Like no, no, not that's very, good. Like I do, I've got a book going, but not really. Like I mostly just write short stories. Books are But I do a mood board for every single one and I get like lyric quotes and yeah. stuff, but it gets me into it. Like That's what I do with my music. Um, yeah. So I listen to a lot of soundtracks, um, so anything that's uh, sort of more dark and, and bloody usually <laughs> has like the Sweet Home soundtrack or, um, or probably Taja or even Evanescence sometimes and then other times if it's more light, um, that a lot of the times honestly I'm not going to lie, a lot of the times it's going to be the Pirates of the Caribbean soundtracks, <gasps> I love those. Yeah, everything is possible when that's playing. <laughs> right? Because I don't know about you guys but I type in time with the music so the faster the music goes I'm typing faster, faster. It just, it just works. Yeah. I, yeah, I love that music. I'm probably just, I, whenever I, I, I usually have to listen to wordless music because whenever I listen to my yes. other music I'm just like, 
<laughs> I have a lot of a lot of other people say they can't listen to music with words. I can. I enjoy it, but that's not going to work for everyone either. So yeah, find definitely find what works for you. Actually, I actually had a question regarding the yes. music. It reminded me of um, when you said only listen to a certain playlist like while you're writing and don't listen to it any other time. Why did you say that? That's a good place to start. Okay. Okay. So the idea behind that is it. It's it's like that. Is it Pavlov's dog? Yeah. Or it's 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 the one who feeds a treat to the dog every time a bell rings, and then when the bell rings, the dog's like, "Where is my treat?" Um, and basically, you're doing that to your brain. So you don't have to stay like that, though. It's good if you still keep that. So whenever I'm having a really hard time getting back into writing or focusing, my original playlist, which is Lindsay Sterling, and only Lindsay Sterling, I put that one on. And, and that starts my brain working again because it is actually changing the neural pathways of your brain apparently so that when you hear that it's like, oh, it's work time and your focus is just there usually. So that's a, it's a good place to start, that one soundtrack and don't play it any other time for a while at least if you can and only use that soundtrack for a while if you can. That's your starting point. Yeah. So from there you can move on to, and it might just be a song, one single song on repeat. I know that Pierce talks about how for him, he has one specific song that changes Parker from time. Packbell's Cannon. Packbell's like Cannon, yeah. G-Main. And just Something. over and over again. Yeah, the, the D minor. Yeah, it's like yeah. every time you go into his office and you're like, ah, oh, yes. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, that's why that is. It's so that you all just rewire your brain. Everything we do is about resetting the brain to train it to do what you want it to do instead of trying to do things in the regular neurotypical manner that works for neurotypical people. And that'll be your starting point. Yeah, I, like to, I tend to just listen to my favourite songs. Yep. If that's working for and you. And I listen to them absolutely. constantly all the time. So yep. it's just like maybe that's why I always think about writing. Yep. <laughs> no, if that works for you, absolutely keep doing it. There, there are no hard and fast rules except please don't kill yourself by not resting enough. <laughs> that's pretty much the only one. Okay, we've got about two minutes left. So who else would like to ask a question or say something? I'm a big fan of a bunch of franchises and I yes. always pick out my favourite characters and I use them to define what I want my characters to be like. Yep. Like King Thrain will be Elven King from Lord of the Rings. I'm mm. just like, what did I like about this character and is there something that I find particularly appealing which matches one of my characters? Yep. It's like, mm. I'll definitely define good guys for bad guys, but if there's a character like Loki, who's a, a both a good guy and a bad guy. It helps with people who are technically the antagonist, but it's told from their view point of yep. view, which makes them the protagonist in a sense. It's a it's a good way to do. It's a good way to start your writing is to start trying to work out and analyze what it is about characters that works for you. So that then instead of doing just fan fiction or writing what someone else has written. I'm not saying fan fiction is bad. All the time. No, <laughs> fan, fan fiction is a great place to start. A lot of my friends write fan fiction. I don't, but only because I have far too many ideas that I will never get written um, if I concentrate on that. Fan fiction is a wonderful place to start. It's a wonderful thing to keep doing as you go along because it exercises you the entire time. It's just that if you want to be making writing your career, eventually you have to write something that is titled original fic. And that is basically going to be millions of tiny little moments of fan fiction melded into one thing anyway because you are your influences in it to a certain extent as well as your own mind your own outlook your influences do shape what you do so fan fiction is definitely not a bad thing but also if you're going to write original characters analyzing what you like about the character and what you don't like about the character is definitely going to exercise you to be able to write good characters in turn that's that's very true all right, we might close up. Anybody else want to say anything else at the end? I've got one question. Yes, go for it. <laughs> when did the shoes come, before or after the final edits? The shoes came before the final edit. Thank you. But I did not wear them until I was finished the book, like the actual draft, and I think I had done one edit. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, all right, we're allowed to wear the shoes. The shoes are coming out. And now I, I wear these a fair bit. They're comfortable, but they have pearls on them. Not real pearls, obviously. I can't afford that. <laughs> Next time it's got to be diamonds, right? <laughs> Every now and then I'll pick something really expensive, but it has to be like the end of a series. It has to be my thing for the end of the series. And then I just save up. I have like a monthly spend of what I'm allowed to spend on fribbles. Um, and that goes into fribbles. So, 
All right, we're going to finish up for the day. I'm going to turn this off and then we can be about our business, I guess. Thank you. Oh, thank you all so much for coming. It was really lovely to see you all here. And thank you for your input. Um, I really love people listening and also having their own uh, input to give. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.